Yeah. Okay, so uh, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for giving me opportunity to present those results, but more so for organizing this workshop so that we have in these difficult times, we have meaningful scientific exchange. Uh, I'll be talking first half of my talk about magnets in, in uh, Van der Waals magnets. Then I will come to the concept of very curvature and the second part about very whole thermal conductivity. All those things have been written as two manuscripts. One by my uh, former undergraduate student, Lara Ortmans, who is now doing PhD in Aachen, and my long-term collaborator, Herit Bao, who is mostly at Tahoku University at Sendai. And the second part about very whole thermal conductivity is a work by Siu Chao Jai, faculty member in Nanjing University of Post and Telecommunications, who visited Delft for a year last year. Uh, now, I, when I got an invitation to talk, I realized that I almost don't know anybody here. And I thought that's a good idea if I put a, a background slide so that you know where I'm coming from, what is my view angle, and why I am paying attention so much to the things which probably are trivial to most of you. Uh, so uh, I, uh, my background is not magnetism. I was working on long time for nano on nano and optomechanics, mechanics, which started to branch out to many things, two of which are magnetic. One is optomagnonics, uh, interaction of magnets with light, with photons. Uh, and that's as an example, our first paper in the field, which I'm still proud of. Uh, another one is nanomechanics with magnetic materials. And here I chose an example because it has to do with Van der Waals uh, magnets. So that's my, uh, I profit extensively from collaboration with experimental groups in Delft. Uh, one group here is the group of Andrea Cavilia, and another one is the group of uh, Harry van der Zand and Peter Steniken. And this uh, picture is the experimental work on mechanical detection of uh, magnetic transition in iron phosphorus sulfide. I'm not going to talk about any of that. Uh, I'm actually uh, missing a lot uh, real uh, communication so that I cannot, after the talks, go to the ground floor, walk into the office and say, hey, you just cool about cool thing, talked about cool things, why don't we discuss? You cannot do the same for me. But if anybody is interested in this or in what I'm going to talk uh, in the main part of my talk, please contact me. We will schedule a meeting and, and discuss it in more detail. Right. Now uh, I will give an introduction about spin waves and magnets, even though probably most people know what I'm talking about and it would be quite elementary. Uh, still, I will do it. So, uh, well, spin waves are waves of magnetic structure. And a textbook example of spin waves is a one dimensional ferromagnetic chain. Uh, you just put a Heisenberg Hamiltonian. You can diagonalize it, and then you get a sinusoidal band, uh, which uh, is uh, which has zero, uh, which becomes parabolic at zero k. So the frequency is zero at zero k. Uh, now you can also, yeah, this is a way to visualize it. So you have uh, magnetic moments which precess, and they precess in phase. So here the wavelength is about half of my picture. Uh, you can include also uh, an isotropy. I will have a couple of Hamiltonians later on the slides. And then in this uh, ferromagnetic chain, you would open a gap, so which refers also to this discussion after the previous talk. Uh, there are many uh, experimental ways you can visualize and image magnets. I have chosen this nice picture, which is, uh, again, my collaboration with yet another group, Tuna van der Sar. In Delft, they are using NV, NV center, sorry, NV center magnetometry to image magnetic fields, and uh, they have imaged uh, spin waves in thin films of zinc, yttrium iron garnet. Uh, this is a European science advance, and we have contributed theory in, in this paper. There are many other things, but okay, it's just to show you that. Uh, spin waves and magnets is something real. 
I will be more using terms magnets because magnets for me are quanta of spin waves. Uh, and if you want to quantize things, you have to use Holstein Primakov transformation, which is you just go on site, uh, the uh, length of, uh, of, of any sp every spin is fixed. So you only have two independent components. For instance, you define as plus and as minus, and you make this nonlinear transformation and introduce creation annihilation operators for magnets. Um, now, okay, uh, that's nonlinear because uh, the length is fixed. But if you're only talking about weak deviations from the preferred direction, then this term in the square root is small. So the square root becomes one and the transformation becomes linear. Uh, and then basically you have a system of uh, linear harmonic oscillators. You can just do Fourier transform, go to K, and then you have, uh, well, just usual Hamiltonian of non-independent, of, of independent, sorry, uh, magnets with the distortion which I have showed, shown on the previous slide. Okay, now let's go to, uh, to uh, Van der Waals magnets. Uh, uh, I will discuss monolayers and bilayers. On a monolayer, you can just take a hexagonal lattice. You can put the Heisenberg model on this hexagonal lattice. This is, to the best of my knowledge, has been first done in this paper, and Sergei is in the audience. Uh, you can solve it, and you get exactly the same dispersion as electrons in graphene which actually this picture is for electrons in graphene. So you have uh, this uh, uh, brilliant zone is a hexagon. You have two non-equivalent Dirac points, K and K prime. And at the gamma point, you have a parabolic dispersion with zero frequency corresponding to zero K. Uh, now, uh, if you include uh, an isotropy, uh, you, uh, okay, let, I, I have a slide for that. So you just shift the whole spectrum up. So you, the only interesting thing is that you open a gap at the gamma point. There are different ways you can include an isotropy. We have chosen uh, to do it like that. So lambda positive or negative would correspond to uh, easy axis or easy plane, but uh, other Hamiltonians would give you qualitatively the same result. Okay, now let's go to bilayers, and I will uh, uh, start with a fully ferromagnetic bilayer, so ferromagnetic in the layer and between the layers. And we were mainly thinking about chromium bromide, of course. So they have this uh, rhombohedral, uh, rhombohedral stacking uh, with uh, A2 uh, above B1 and no other uh, exchange couplings between the layers. Uh, this has been done first by Over, but we managed to include an isotropy and also obtain analytical expressions. Uh, so what you get, I will have a picture later on. Uh, first of all, you get four magnet bands, which are different. The overall structure is similar, similar to a monolayer, so you also have Dirac points and you have parabolic dispersion at a gamma point. At the gamma point, only one frequency is zero, and another band which is there is split up. And at the Dirac point, you have, without an isotropy, threefold degeneracy. So you have two bands, which, uh, again, I will show a picture a little bit later. You have two bands which have linear dispersion, like in graphene, and you have two other bands which are parabolic. One is split off, and one is going exactly through the Dirac point so that you get threefold degeneracy. Uh, now, uh, these are expressions for without an isotropy. We also have expressions with an isotropy, which I don't show. But if you include an isotropy, you, the two uh, important things is that, that uh, you don't have any more zero frequency anywhere. So even at k equals zero, you shift the band up. And you break uh, this threefold degeneracy. So now you only have this twofold degeneracy. Right, uh, now uh, next thing I will show you is what happens if uh, you have uh, anti-ferromagnetic coupling between layers. Now we are still doing it for rhombohedral structure 
And if I, I mean, I listened to the two previous talk and now I see that we probably should have been more careful and start with the monoclinic. But anyway, we have done what we have done and we got interesting results. The results are for this, if you have ferromagnetic coupling in the layer and anti-ferromagnetic between the layers, you only have, well, you still have four bands, but they are, each of them is doubly degenerate. And you cannot, uh, I mean, you, you don't remove this degeneracy. Uh, overall structure is still the same. So uh, quadratic dispersion at the gamma point, uh, Dirac points. Now at Dirac points, you have two bands which are parabolic. So for this, I have a picture like this. So you have uh, a gap opens at the Dirac point. Uh, now you can also include, uh, you can also take uh, an isotropy, include an isotropy. Uh, now you need an isotropy in the in layer coupling and inter layer coupling. So you have actually four constants, uh, exchange coupling in each layer uh, and uh, sorry, in lay between the layers and then isotropy in lay between the layers. And uh, we, we were able to solve it with uh, all four constants. I mean, the, one, the main technical problem is uh, like with every uh, anti-ferromagnet, uh, the uh, Halstein Primakov transformation doesn't diagonalize the Hamiltonian. So after you do Halstein Primakov, you end up with terms which are A, A, and A dagger, A dagger. And to diagonalize that, it's still quadratic. So to diagonalize that, you have to do Bogolubov transformation which is again something which we know from anti-ferromagnets. Uh, here it's a bit unexpected because we were not sure because some couplings are ferromagnetic, some are anti-ferromagnetic, but we had to do it. And, but then, then we can diagonalize everything. Uh, right, so we end up with this, as I said, with this, uh, with this, with this gap. Um, okay, great. And yeah, and uh, an isotropy doesn't do anything quantitatively different. So it uh, introduces some quantitative difference, but the spectrum is basically the same. Uh, right, now, uh, now we come to the main point. So we were talking about this spectrum of magnets in monolay and bilay, and we see these Dirac points. Now, is there any way we can observe anything related to the Dirac points? That's one question which we wanted to answer. And another question is, if we do, the bonus question is whether we can discriminate between the Dirac points, whether we can design some property where we would see difference between K and K prime. Now, first question, if you start thinking about it, okay, so, well, we know graphene, Right, and in graphene, we know that the Fermi level is at the Dirac points. And that's why in all electron properties, in the first instance, we just see the uh, linear dispersion. Right, and then we can start opening the gap and talk about bilayers and everything. But magnets are bosons, right? So, and if you start thinking about uh, what, what do you do with the bosons? I mean, you thermally occupy them, and you first occupy this uh, gamma point. So you have this boring, boring parabolic dispersion. Uh, and the position of the Dirac point uh, is comparable to the Curie temperature. So you would first of all only occupy uh, the Dirac point, thermally occupied at the Curie temperature. And even if you are close to the Curie temperature, still the occupation of the gamma point is much less than the occupation of the uh, gamma point. So in this sense, if you just measure usual properties of magnets, you would just see exactly the same as ferromagnetic chain or square lattice ferromagnet, because it's just parabolic. It's parabolic with a gap and nothing else. So we need some properties which would be specifically singling out something uh, the spectrum around the Dirac point. And that's also something which we know. We know that this property is Berry curvature. So the Berry curvature is a property, property of the spectrum, 
with this definition. So it's defined for every band and every k and u are the block functions. And for this Dirac like spectrum, it's only non zero around k and k prime. So this is the pictures uh, which uh, we have calculated uh, for this anti ferromagnetic coupling. I will also show ferromagnetic coupling on the last slide. Next, next slide. And we see indeed that the Bure curvature is non zero only around k and k prime. So these are for two different bands. So we only had two bands. Uh, but you see that uh, the sign is different for k and k prime in every band. And it's also different opposite for different bands, which means that the topology in this sense is trivial. So if you start calculating Charon numbers, Charon numbers are zero. We don't have any states in the gap, and that's also something which we know. Uh, you can make topology non-trivial by using uh, by adding delashinsky mare interactions. I will come to them on the very last slide, uh, but uh, generally we didn't put much effort in this direction. Uh, now, okay, good. Topology is trivial. Do, do we still have something interesting? Yes. But to have something interesting, we need to break symmetry. Now I'm coming back to fully ferromagnetic bilayer. Again, we are thinking about chromium bromide. Fully ferromagnetic layer, bilayer has inversion symmetry. If you want to see something interesting, we need to break this time inversion symmetry. So we need extra terms in the Hamiltonian. And uh, we could have used DMI, we, we, we added them, but Mainly, we have used this term, which is opposite in different layers. Uh, now, this term doesn't occur naturally. It would have occurred naturally if we would ever have a uh, Van der Waals magnet in which we would have different atoms in different uh, in different layers. That we don't have, as far as I know. So we can uh, induce it by slightly doping. Uh, our system, and then you will have electrons in one layer and holes in another layer, and they would uh, induce this kind of term. That also uh, introduced some inconvenience, which I will come back to on my last slide, but for the time being, I will just assume that we have this Hamiltonian with this anisotropy, uh, and uh, this is just uh, the, the pictures which I have promised. So without anisotropy, you have at the Dirac point, you have this threefold degeneracy. You actually even have this threefold degeneracy if the anisotropy is the same in layer and between the layers, which I, I forgot to mention. You need to, to break it with anisotropy, you really need different anisotropy in and between the layers. But this thing breaks, uh, breaks the degeneracy, no problem. So you have one band which was split and it remains split. But here, this degeneracy by this term, you just split into three. So now you have four bands. You can calculate the curvature for these four bands. Uh, again, uh, you have uh, opposite very curvatures for, uh, for, for K and K prime, which is very important. Uh, but the total sum at every k, the total sum of very curvatures for all four bands is zero. So again, in this case, in this sense, the topology is again trivial. You don't have any states in the gap. Okay, great. Now the property which we are going to talk uh, to, to look at is uh, the thermal whole conductivity of magnets. Uh, now you can derive this expression. So you start with this kind of Kubo formula for the energy current, which is in the literature. And then you can derive this expression. Uh, now uh, this is whole component. So that's X, Y component of the thermal conductivity. Uh, it's sum over all bands. So we have four bands over all four bands. It's sum over all case. We have very curvature here. And we have this coefficient C, which only depends on the frequency. And that's essentially some combination of the Bose functions integrated several times and summed up. Okay, now uh, 
we have at least something which is determined, which is uh, determined by the spectrum at the Dirac point, because the beta curvature is only non-zero at the Dirac point. So if you look at this thermal hall conductivity, we don't care about this parabolic dispersion. Okay, great. Now let's see. Uh, we know that, again, as, as I said, the Berry curvature is only uh, non-zero at the Dirac point, which means we have contribution from K and we have contribution from K prime. And so the total is the sum of the two contributions. But C only depends on of, of omega and the energy, so the frequency at K and K prime points are exactly the same. So if you just look at the total thermal whole conductivity, these, con these contributions, sorry, this coefficient is the same, but, but the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, Berry curvatures are opposite. So if we just sum up the two, we just get zero. So that's a great property, which only is determined by the Dirac points, but the problem is that it's exactly zero. Now, well, we can, instead of taking plus, we can take minus. It would be very polarized conductivity. Since those are opposite, the, 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 the difference is not zero. The difference is just the double of, of this. Uh, now, okay, you can define any properties. Can you measure that? And that's our central point. So we have actually two proposals, how we can measure it. Uh, one proposal is uh, to, to use this thermal flux density. So we propose to take a, a sample of this H shape. Now we are talking about magnons. So for magnons, you can, uh, well, you can, you can, you cannot measure magnons directly. So you, you can measure temperature gradient or create temperature gradient, and you can measure energy flux. So we propose to create energy gradient here. So this delta TL, if we create energy gradients, okay, we create magnets with both K and K prime, but they have opposite uh, thermal hole conductivity. So K prime would go here. It would disappear from the sample and doesn't play, would not play any role, but K goes here and goes to this uh, connection between those two things. Uh, so it makes it to the right, and on the right it has again to go here because it's it's a whole contribution, and so it contributes to the building up uh, the temperature gradient here. So if you measure temperature gradient or whatever energy flux uh, on the right as a response to the temperature gradient on the left. It's not sensitive to the total thermal flux. It's sensitive, actually, if you look carefully to the difference of K and K prime. And you can calculate that. So we have defined the, the resistance-like quantity, which is the uh, ratio of the uh, temperature difference on the left and the energy current. And it would be proportional to this uh, value contribution squared. Uh, now, what is important is that this quantity is, I mean, of course, there are many things which can carry energy, right? You, you have, uh, you have uh, not just magnets, you have phonons and you have electrons, and, and usually phonons are much more efficient. Uh, now, here, that's an insulator, so we, we don't have electrons. Uh, now, we do have phonons, but phonons uh, don't have whole component because phonons don't interact with magnetization. So, of course, phonons carry energy, but they can only ca carry energy straight. So, everything which is whole is due to magnets, and this is why all this contribution is due to magnet transport. Even if the role of magnets in the longitudinal transport is probably way less than, 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 than phonons. Now, another, uh, another proposal, which I don't have much time to talk about, I will just mention briefly, uses the valley zeybeck effect. So we propose to take this bar and create a temperature gradient along the bar. Then again, you have K, which go to the right, and can K prime magnets, which go to the left. And we propose to have uh, platinum contacts 
uh, which I think this is uh, this is the the, uh, the 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 cross section, so the side view. Uh, now uh, you you have exchange. So basically, if you have K and T prime, you have spin current, and platinum has a strong spin orbit interaction, so it can convert spin current into charge current into voltage via spin hole effect, uh, and this is the way. Uh, to, to measure to measure magnet current. Okay, now let me go. That that's my last slide. Uh, before the conclusions, I have uh, these are the results uh, for the valley hole conductivity as a function of temperature. Now, first of all, I don't expect most of you to know what this scale means, but this is like about factor of ten higher than what you typically measure in insulators. So that just to show that. Uh, the, the order of magnitude is reasonable. By the way, I should say that we have taken the parameters for chromium bromide wherever we, we knew the parameters. Uh, now, uh, different curves are for different values of U, and for U, we have no idea what it really could be. I will discuss it in a second. Uh, what you also see that there is no effect below about 18, 15 Kelvin. Curie temperature is 34 Kelvin, so indeed you start only seeing it closer to the Curie temperature, which is again not surprising. It just means that the uh, the 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 Dirac points are not not thermally populated if you are at low temperatures. We have looked, I believe it's not on the picture. We have looked also at the effect of Galashinsky Marie interactions, and we see that they suppress the effect. Uh, it doesn't matter so much for chromium bromide because in chromium bromide they are not strong. We have actually also looked uh, what happens if we have uh, if we have antiferromagnetic uh, coupling between the layers, uh, and that we, we thought about chromium iodide. And in chromium iodide they are strong, so chromium iodide is definitely not better. So chromium bromide is best uh, for, for, for observation of this effect. But of course, if you have DMI and DMI becomes strong, then at some point you have, you, you split your, your band so much that you start having inverse population and then you get, uh, you get states, topological states in the gap and that would be a completely different story, which we haven't looked at at all. Now, maybe the last thing uh, before, before I go to the conclusions is damping. And that's really an elephant in the room. We, we don't really know anything. First of all, we have no idea what would be the damping for just usual regular magnums in 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 in, in bilayers of chromium bromide or chromium iodide. I, I don't think anybody measured it. I don't think anybody calculated it. People kind of believe uh, that that magnums don't decay too fast. And of course, we need coherent magnets for the for the whole effect. Otherwise, uh, I mean, if they start scattering between the values, then values, then then the whole effect again. Now, on top of that, uh, we to to introduce this U term, which which we need to break the symmetry. We propose to introduce electrons and holes. And of course, if we have electrons and holes, then we have an extra channel of damping for magnets. Because I mean, of course, that's a little bit like a metal, and, and magnets in metal are much better damped. Uh, so, I mean, it's something which which would probably require a little bit uh, more investigation. What would be damping mechanisms? What it would give? So, for the time being, we assume that we probably can make this doping small, uh, and the damping would be insignificant. But but that's something which probably we would need to, to do before uh, before experiments could, could before experiment again could, could pick them up. Okay, so that's uh, that's all. So I was talking about uh, magnets, so which have Dirac like spectra in monolayers and bilayers. And in particular Dirac points can be probed by the Berry curvature and uh, the way to probe them is to look at the thermal hole conductivity, which also means to separate value. And as I mentioned already this is written as, as two things. This is still uh, on archive, uh, and, and this has been published already in Physical Review B. Thank you for your attention.
Yaroslav, thank you very much for a very clear talk. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, uh, I had a question. So uh, if, if you propose uh, generating this uh, inversion symmetry breaking term through doping, wouldn't this also have an impact on your transport measurements? Yes, sure. I mean, of course, if you have free electrons and free holes, they would also do something and, and yeah. screw up the effect. But yeah, would, so that, that's uh, a little bit of... Sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah, what I wanted to do is, of course, a balance. I mean, if you take this U too large, then, of course, you need also to have too many free electrons and then the effect is gone. So you have to, 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 to do it sufficiently small so that you still, you still uh, break the symmetry. So it's still, uh, the splitting is still bigger than the line width, but not big enough so that you have significant effect on, on, on the transport. I mean, we had some estimates, which I would call reasonable. Uh, again, that's predominantly theoretical uh, audience. I'm not ashamed to say that, but if I talk to experimentalists, I would be a bit more careful. Um, one question I had was, um, I think you mentioned that uh, the anisotropy has to be different between the layers. Inter and intra layer have to be different to gap it out. So what is this? Is there some symmetry that is present if they're equal? Like it's hard for me to see what's special about the... Yes, that should be a symmetry argument, absolutely. But uh, I would not be able to say right now which mm -hmm. one. Okay. But, but I'm pretty sure the expressions we have, uh, mm -hmm. which I don't have on the slides, but I, I do have a manuscript with the expression written. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure if you put this uh, an isotropy the same, mm -hmm. we still have the, the, the threefold degeneracy. Okay. Any other questions? Maybe another question. Um, you mentioned that you know, towards the end that the DM interaction suppresses the effect. So as far as I understand, like the, the effect itself, it relied on relatively little, right? That it re relied on the Berry curvature being relatively localized near the K point yes. and, and you having gapped the K, the K point. So yes. is it affecting any one of those two things or is there some other reason it suppresses the effect? Uh, yeah, I, I, indeed. I, I think it's just affecting a gap, and it's affecting a gap in the way we don't want it to be affected. Yeah, affected so it just pushes it down. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have those pictures now, but we have calculated indeed the spectra with DMI close to the Dirac points, and mm -hmm. that, that, that confirms. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, if not, uh, thank the speaker again. I want to thank both speakers of the session. Um, so it's a very nice talk today. Um